Good morning. Well, I hope you're ready for the day today. Uh, I hope no pipes froze this week. I hope that uh, you stayed warm, comfortable. You didn't have to get out. Hopefully you weren't one of those last minute shoppers that was getting milk, bread, and uh, stuff so you could crowd in there. Uh, of course, we've had some of our teachers especially uh, be off from work for uh, a long period of time this week. And so uh, I'm glad that you're tuning in this morning, uh, that you got internet. We've had a couple of more cold days. So uh, we'll see what happens this week as it warms up and rains nearly the whole week. But uh, it's a great day to be alive. Why? God has a purpose for us, a plan for us. He wants us to come together and worship him this day. Let's look at Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. The writer of this section calls it stalled. And the reason he calls it stalled is because they're fixing to have a plan and God's going to uh, cause it to not finish the, the plan. It's going to stall. It's not going to get finished. And so he's got this coming up. Let me ask you, uh, what are some of your favorite advertisements? That's right. Can you think of some commercials that you watched that you thought were funny or uh, anything like that? Can you can you remember a few of those? Um, you know, I like uh, the Mannings commercial uh, with Eli and his dad, and they're eating cereal there with his kids. <laughs> that one just gets me uh, to laughing every time I see it when he comes into the room with his bowl of cereal. <laughs> So uh, there are all kinds of different commercials. And you have to say, well, what is the goal of advertisers? Is it to make me laugh? Is it to be funny? Well, that can be a side goal, but that's not the main goal. What's the main goal? To sell a product or a service. Now, are they always successful? They must be or they wouldn't keep doing it. I remember that there are some commercials that make me laugh, but I go, I don't even remember what product they were selling. <laughs> they did a great job of entertainment, but did a terrible job of promoting the product because I don't remember it. Well, that's about our lives, isn't it? Why do people find it difficult to give up control of their lives. Give up control. You know, you, by advertisers, they are trying to sneak in <laughs> and get their product out in front of you or cause you to have a desire to say, ooh, and I, I need this. I need to go out and buy it. I need to purchase it. So, uh, but, you know, for most people, we have a difficult time giving up control of our lives. We really don't want anybody to tell us what to do. And that's why advertisers kind of make it funny or unusual, something that will get in your mind. You, you know, we used to call them earworm songs, you know, little advertisements uh, that had a little jingle to it. <laughs> you know, like McDonald's, uh, two all beef patties, special sauce, lace, cheese, pickled onion, sesame seed bun. <laughs> I can still remember that from the commercial. So what are these things? Why is it so difficult for people to give up control in their life? We see that it's part of our nature. We like that independence. You know, you almost have to have a dictator over you to force you to do things you don't want to do. Well, we're going to see that's a little different here in Genesis when it starts off. Uh, you remember after the flood, it's only one family, right? It's Noah and his three sons. And these three sons, you know, begin to spread out, have more children. Uh, they become clans uh, in which they get together. And they're, they're, as a lot of families, they're pretty unified in this idea, but we see, just like God had said before the flood, that 
man's wickedness, his thoughts are towards evil. And uh, so here we are with this building together. Let's look at chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, and, and let's see what you think. The whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As the people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Sinar and settled there and said to each other, Come, let us make oven-fired bricks. They used bricks for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Now, if you remember, part of God's command was be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth. Well, this group of people decided they didn't want to fill the whole earth. Instead, we want to make a city and stay together and be unified. And they got to the point that says, we want to make a name for ourselves. We want to become famous. And so let's work together and build a tower that goes to the sky. Now, we would call this a ziggurat. And it had a staircase that went up. And as they built it up from these bricks, because they had no not much stone, they had to make it from mud and fire the bricks up so that they would be hard and you could build on top of each other. But you'll see here, that these people had a plan, a unified plan. They were together. They had the same language, same vocabulary. Why? It was of the same family. And they says, well, hey, let's just stay together. God's plan was for everybody to move out. Well, they moved out a little way to this valley. And then they decided, no, let's all stay together. Let's work together. Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's build something to worship God, or God's plural. Notice how they said, come, let us make oven fire bricks. Technology increased. They learned how to do this, and they used this technology to build a monument, not only cities, but a tower. What was this tower for? Well, we know based off history that a lot of these towers were used for worship. They were used to offer sacrifices on, uh, and they build them taller and taller. Usually the, the temple uh, mount or the temple there was the highest point of any settlement, and it's the same way here. It says, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the sky. Let's just see how high we can build this and uh, make a name for ourselves. Now, uh, part of this uh, thing you can do to help your class is to get you some Lego blocks, a whole big container of Lego blocks, pour them out on the table, or some, you know, Jenga blocks or something like that, and have a little game at the beginning of your uh, class as people are coming in, get them to compete against each other, put to have a couple of tables in there, let them sit around those tables and start building them and stacking them. See how how you can get them to stack. <laughs> you may even want to take cups. You can use uh, plastic cups or, or foam cups and get you a whole big container of them and let them start building. See how high can you go? <laughs> this will emphasize this idea of the pride of building and high, high. That's what it is. Get closer to God, our gods in their case. They just did not want to be scattered. They said, look at there, verse uh, uh, four. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Well, it was a, really a defiance against God. They didn't want God to tell them what to do. They didn't want to scatter and fill and multiply over the whole earth. No, let's just stay here, build a name for ourselves, a city. So they decided to defy God. Well, 
let me ask you, how are selfishness and creating a name for yourself a display of distrust in God? <laughs> Great discussion for you to talk about. How? Why is my selfishness against God? Why is me creating a name or becoming famous against God? It's a distrust in God. How? How is that? Because we can even still do that today, can't we? <laughs> yep. <clears throat> when everything becomes about me and we don't care about other people, it's against God. Because God says we're to love all people. Why? They are created in his image. And we are to love them. Now, to love them sometimes means uh, giving up some of what I enjoy to help somebody else or some of my economic ability to help someone else or my time or my talents. Sometimes we can become selfish and only do things for ourselves and we find out that that is really a distrust in God. God has made us a steward, not only of our finances, but our time and our talents that we should be sharing with our church, with our community, with those who are in need. The Bible calls the lowest group of people orphans and widows. And what he's talking about here is the people that society neglects or looks down on. You and I are supposed to be helping those underprivileged. Well, selfishness means I'm not going to help anybody unless it benefits me. And that is a distrust in God. Where we don't depend on God, we begin to depend on ourselves, on my own wealth. You remember in the New Testament, there's a story there, a man who had a great crop and Instead of selling it, he tried to hoard it. He says, I will build bigger barns to keep it all for himself. And yet, the moral of the story that was given that God would take his life that night was that building bigger for just yourself is not going to help you. God gives us this ability of being stewards. Everything comes from God. All of us are given different amounts. We see that in the parable of the talents, where different ones were given different amounts of talents, but they were still to be stewards of what they were given. You and I, well, yeah, we like to build up our wealth, our things that we have, you know, how many tools or cars or tractors or uh, baseball cards or memorabilia, uh, how much is enough? Coin collecting, uh, all of these hobbies and all, You sometimes you're so amazed that people collect so much. It can get to the point of even hoarding everything that you get and keeping it in a house. You see that television show about hoarders. And how it's actually a mental problem of, of people who try to collect and not get rid of anything. Well, you and I are stewards of all the gifts of God, all of our money, our time, and our talents. And he expects us to use them wisely. Well, let's see how this is done. Let's look at this next section your writer talks about is reviewed. That's verses 5 through 7. It says, Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the humans were building. And the Lord says, If they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan will do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse them, uh, confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. All right, a review is given. 
The story here is given as the Lord came down, as though he didn't already know about it, but he does. This was just a way of telling the story uh, from God's uh, uh, coming in to these people. Uh, it's a, a storytelling technique uh, to show this movement, this involvement. Uh, God already knows what's going on. Uh, but they use the story of God coming down as the way of him intervening in what is going on. So, how did God intervene? Notice he says, uh, they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language. And there's a little phrase in here that kind of gets our attention. Listen, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Is the story here saying that men that work together is nothing impossible that they can do? What does this topic mean here? This, this little phrase, that nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. It's a way of saying that they're working together to accomplish a goal. And remember God's command to Noah and his families after they get off the ark is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This group of people has stopped from doing God's plan. And it seems they're doing something impossible by building a town and building this thing and for mankind, it would seem impossible that all of this is taking place, but not for God. He saw what was happening and why the main reason was for this. He said, well, I'm going to have to get their mind off of this plan. Why? Because they're not following God's orders. They're, they're starting to stay in one place and that they are working together to try to uh, be even more selfish, and, and we're going to have to stop that. It says, uh, uh, come, let's go down and confuse the language. Remember, they were all of the same family, same clan. They had the same language, same dialect, all of that. And so instead of destroying the earth again <laughs> because of this disobedience and this wickedness, another plan is given by God. He says, come, let's go down. Now, some people say, what does that mean, let us? Well, this could be in the heavenly court. It could be just among the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and used it as a group, let us, which is really one God doing this, but talking about it in their three identities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whatever it is, it's a decision that was made. In this decision, they changed their hearing and their speech. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, it says here that they confuse their language so that no one could understand one another's speech. Well, they were all in one family. Something had to happen there to where these different languages caused them to quit working together, did it? Well, we know that you can learn other languages. Is that not true? It takes a while. I've known several people that says, oh, I can speak four or five languages. And it's because they've lived in different cultures or been in different countries. And they moved around a lot and picked up all these languages and dialects and things like that. But here also we see this confusion was for the first time within a family, a family group, a, a large group of people that have grown up speaking the same language. And with a snap of the fingers, God causes them not to be able to understand each other. All of a sudden, they're speaking different words. They think they are communicating properly, but the language is different. Wow. 
This is just the opposite of the day of Pentecost. Let me ask you this question. What do you find significant about verse 5? Listen to that again. What do you find significant about verse 5? The Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the humans were building. Do you find anything significant about that verse? Great way to start talking for them and finding out what's going on in there. And then after you've read the rest of this and talked about it for a minute, how can unity of purpose get in the way of fulfilling God's purpose? You know, can you agree among uh, a group that you're going to do something, um, but it doesn't fulfill God's purpose? Well, sure, we can make plans. You know, one of the things that that uh, I've gotten man in trouble a lot of times is plans for war, where one country invades another country to either take their resources or their land or to put them under servitude, all of these things. And even though everybody in that room that are the military leaders agree this is what we're going to do, what if that's not part of God's plan? Well, you can agree on a decision, but it may not be a good decision, right? <laughs> And things can happen. We see throughout the Old Testament in particular that when you attack God's people and then the people would turn to God, God would defeat the enemy. Now, he may use part of their army. He may use the natural environment to cause problems. In fact, we see disasters have come from winds and darkness. And even a small group of people that work together uh, caused a large army to run in terror. Is it God's plan? How does unity of purpose get in the way of fulfilling God's purpose? What's God's purpose in this situation? God's purpose is to disperse mankind across the globe because this is his plan. And these people have tried to stop God's plan. They stopped moving into other areas of the world. They just stayed right there and begun to build something for themselves, something that would make them famous. That's what they were after, was this famous. Our city's bigger than your city. Our tower is taller than your tower. <laughs> In fact, we got to do that with these sometimes football games and you get mayors of the different cities in these football games that say, uh, we're going to beat you so bad, but if we lose, I'm going to send you, uh, you know, if you're from Mississippi, a catfish, a huge catfish uh, uh, meal. And of course, then if you were from, uh, say, Louisiana, and they said, well, we'll send you crawfish <laughs> if we lose. <laughs> It becomes this bet, this plan, I'm better than you, and, you know, we're going to win, and all this kind of stuff. These people thought they were winners by disobeying God. Not so much because they had made a plan to disobey God. They made a plan for themselves. Use their time, their resources, their talents to begin to build this city and this tower. And instead of destroying them, God, in his wisdom, use, well, we'll just make them unable to understand the language that they were familiar with. So their ears and their voice were changed as new dialects and new languages happened among smaller groups. All of a sudden, they couldn't work together and they had to disperse. God solved this plan that was against his by moving them out like he originally planned. All right. Look at number three, verses eight and nine. 
The writer here calls it dispersed, that they move out from there. So in verse 8 and 9, it says, So from there the Lord scattered them throughout the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. They couldn't communicate anymore. Therefore, it was called Babylon. From there, the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. Now, we know a little bit about different languages, don't we? And how they developed among people groups. This is why our international or uh, mission board is concentrating on smaller and smaller groups to evangelize them because we want them to hear the gospel in their heart language, the one that they speak every day at home. We want them to be able to understand the gospel in their own language. That's why it takes so much work. As people are translating the White Cliff uh, Bible translators are trying to translate the Bible in all these other languages. Uh, it's to bring people together again with the message of Christ. Hmm. We'll look at uh, the next question your writer here brings up for you to talk about in your class. Why and how did people scatter after God confused their language? When God confused their language, why and how did they do it? Interesting thing to talk about. Well, all of a sudden, they couldn't talk with each other. What What do you do when you can't communicate? You have to find some other people that can either learn your language or share your language, and we can communicate better. Now, I don't speak much other languages. I have studied other languages. I have I learned a little bit of Spanish in high school. I learned uh, Hebrew and Greek at my seminary. Uh, we took some German in, in a semester of German in college. So I learned a little bit about other languages and how there are some similarities. Some of the words are very similar to the language I speak, which is English. But at the same time, you learn how difficult it is to learn somebody else's vocabulary, sentence structure, verbs, nouns, adverbs, all of this, and that sometimes people use phrases where we use one word to describe that. Some languages put their verbs first and subjects second. A lot of times in English, we use our nouns first and our verbs second. <laughs> so you have to learn these differences. And you begin to appreciate the differences and how these languages have evolved. Well, here, the why people scattered is because it's part of God's plan. And he used this differing languages to cause his plan to move forward. You say, you and I don't understand all of God's plans. God does. And it tells us that we can trust God with his plan. You see, in their day and time, they had a little problem with trust with God. So God did something with their language, with their tongues and how they speak and their ears and their brain of how to process these words and how they couldn't understand each other, even when they used sign language and everything. It just got so confusing that they quit building the city. They quit building the tower, a monument to themselves. And because they couldn't communicate, it caused them to spread out as part of God's plan. Hmm. Well, what do we learn about God's sovereignty over his creation? Yeah, he's in charge. Even when we don't want him to be in charge, <laughs> God's still in charge. I heard one commentator, a uh, preacher, once said that God hits straight licks with crooked sticks. <laughs> we may not see how this helps us or how it, helps God's plan until we look backwards and say, hmm, well, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> well, 
One of the great things is you and I get to trust God. He's in control. We may not like the circumstances or uh, the time or the difficulty or the waiting on God's plan. But one of the great things we can rest assured of, God is a sovereign. God is in control. Even if we may not see it at that moment, God has a plan. And he is working his plan, even behind the scenes. <laughs> even when we don't understand it, he does. Even when we're confused by all that's going on, he is not. And we need to learn to trust God's plan for us. Yeah. Well, what are, uh, what are some ways that you can safeguard against having selfish motives? That's one of the big things, because this is the story about selfishness, isn't it? And God took care of the problem of selfishness by confusing the languages and caused them then not to be able to agree on this selfishness, and they had to spread out. How can, what are some ways you can safeguard against having selfish motives? Part of that is having friends that can be honest with you, that will tell you when you're being selfish. Your spouse may say that's selfish. <laughs> Your children may say that's selfish. Your co-workers at work can tell you that's selfish or warn you. Uh, so some of the ways you can safeguard against being selfish is check your humility meter. Weighing your decisions, is this just going to benefit me? Does this benefit my family, my church, my community? You can begin to evaluate your, some of your decisions before you make those decisions to find out, God, is this part of your plan? Is this selfish of me? Should I look and ask you for more wisdom, more understanding, look at your ways? I can read your word to help me find out about not being selfish. God, I know you own it all. You are sovereign. You are in control. Help me to be part of your plan, a productive steward of your plan. Always evaluate yourself through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, through the scriptures that back those teachings up. Guess what? You're always growing. Now, one of the things I can say, we're all sinners, every one of us. We go to church because that's the hospital for sinners. Why we get to hear the truth of God's word. We get to minister and praise God together with other people just like us who are not perfect, but who are trying to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us to live as Jesus lived. Well, I hope you have a great day today. Be safe in the rain the coming week. May God bless you as you read his word, as you talk with him through prayer, and that you're willing to minister to other people this week. May God bless you as you become unselfish and that you always acknowledge God and he is in control. God bless you.